Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 645 for June 11th, 2017. Coming up in a few minutes. You get to these sort of plateaus and you would think, I remember when we got together with Seagram's, you would think I would have come out of the Seagram's building and done the touchdown sign and there you go. But all you are is disoriented. I mean, it's just, it's really sort of a chase sport versus a, versus a finish sport. 30 years ago, Tom Bullitt revived his great-great-grandfather's whiskey recipe, or so the story goes. Back in the mid-1800s, Augustus Bullet's Frontier Whiskey was probably what we would have labeled a rye whiskey today. It was made from two-thirds rye and one-third corn. This week, Diageo unveiled the first widespread release of Bullet Barrel Strength Bourbon in New York City. We'll catch up with Tom Bullet later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. I'll also have the calendar of events, this week's Your Voice, and the What I'm Tasting This Week department, all coming up on this week's Whiskey Cast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Thursday's election surprise in the UK had some quick impacts on the whiskey market. Shares of Diageo and Pernod Ricard both showed strong gains Friday in London and Paris trading on hopes that Prime Minister Theresa May's lackluster showing in the snap election might weaken Britain's position in the upcoming Brexit talks. The British pound also fell almost 2% against the U.S. dollar Friday, with a pound now worth $1.27. Let's compare that to almost a year ago, June 23, 2016, as U.K. voters went to the polls in the Brexit election. That day, the pound closed at $1.48. It hasn't come close to that since. Now, why is this important? Well, Brown Foreman released its latest quarterly earnings report Wednesday, Global sales were off by 4% over the same period last year. Now, Brown Foreman executives pointed to last year's sale of Southern Comfort and Tuaka to Sazerac as part of the reason. The money from that deal hit the company's books during this quarter last year, with a resulting impact on earnings. However, they also cited the stronger U.S. dollar. Brown Foreman does about 52% of its business internationally, and a stronger dollar makes its products more expensive in other countries. Here's one example. Brown Foreman's overall UK sales were off by 12%, even though its flagship Jack Daniels brand became the best-selling whiskey brand in the UK last year. Globally, Jack Daniels sales gained by 3% over the previous year, while Woodford Reserve sales were up by 14%. Also from the markets, Remy Cointreau reported stronger-than-expected annual profits for its recent fiscal year, Much of that is based on stronger cognac sales, of course. But here is one interesting note from the report. One of the highlighted brands was the Botanist Gin, which turned in a double-digit percentage sales increase, largely in the U.S. and in travel retail. The Botanist, of course, is made at Brooklady Distillery on Isla. It was created by Jim McEwen and was part of the deal when Remy bought Brooklady back in 2012. I mentioned Bullet Bourbon earlier, and now that brand is part of a legal battle between Diageo and Deutsch Family Wines and Spirits. After buying the Redemption brand last year, Deutsch unveiled a new bottle and label design recently, and Diageo claims that new design is a knockoff of the packaging for Bullet. Diageo filed a lawsuit in federal court this week in New York City, and wants the court to order the new Redemption bottles removed from the market. No comment from either side. By the way, Diageo and Sazerac have settled a similar lawsuit that we mentioned last December. 
Diageo had accused Sazerac of mimicking the bullet packaging when it redesigned the bottles for its Dr. McGillicuddy's line of flavored liqueurs. In other news, Ireland's government is calling for a European-wide ban on alcohol advertising. Irish Health Minister Marcella Corker and Kennedy told health experts meeting in Brussels this week that alcohol plays a key role in crime, suicide, and mental illness, and that the most effective response would be a ban on alcohol advertising, promotion, and sponsorship. The Irish Times reports European Union culture ministers have agreed to review an EU directive on multimedia promotion and advertising for alcohol. At the same time, the National Football League is ending its longtime ban on television ads for whiskeys and other spirits during its games, at least for one year. Broadcasters will be allowed to run up to four spirits ads per game, and brands will have to include social responsibility messaging in their ads. The move comes as distilled spirits increase their share of the U.S. drinks market, while beer has lost market share over the past 15 years. Now, polo, known as the sport of kings, has never had a problem being associated with whiskey. Chivas Brothers introduced a new Royal Salute 21-year-old polo edition blend at this week's Centibal Royal Salute Polo Cup matches in Singapore. The blend is a bit lighter than the traditional Royal Salute 21 and was created by Chivas Blending Director Sandy Hislop. It's exclusive to the duty-free shop at Singapore's Changi Airport this month and will be available in travel retail worldwide starting in September with a recommended retail price of $140 a bottle. Also out in travel retail, Craig Ellicke's new 33-year-old single malt is making its debut in Europe this month. It's the successor to the award-winning 31-year-old Craig Ellicke. Only 1,700 bottles will be available. It'll be out first at the World Duty Free Airport Shops in the UK, followed by Europe and Asia later this summer. No word on pricing. Amrut is releasing the second edition of Spectrum. It's single malt finished in casks made from staves, from different types of barrels. In this case, the barrels were made using staves from new charred American oak, new toasted French oak, ex Oloroso sherry, and ex Pedro Jimenez sherry casks. The original Spectrum release last year won a number of awards. 1,800 bottles of what's being called Spectrum 004 will be available worldwide. In the U.S., they'll have a recommended retail price of $160 a bottle. Last November, MGP bought the George Remus whiskey brand from its Cincinnati-based founders and is releasing a new George Remus straight bourbon this month in the Midwestern U.S. It's a high rye blend of bourbons that have been matured for at least four years. This is MGP's first large-scale foray into the retail whiskey business. Of course, it's been supplying whiskey to bottlers ever since it bought the old Seagram's Distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Rockdown Distillery in Little Rock, Arkansas is celebrating its 7th anniversary this month and is releasing a one-time only sherry cask matured wheat whiskey to celebrate. It'll go on sale at the anniversary party June 24th and will only be available at the distillery. Meanwhile, the Laws Whiskey House in Denver is releasing two new bottled and bond whiskeys, a two-grain straight bourbon and a rare bottled and bond straight corn whiskey. Both were distilled back in the fall of 2012. They'll be available only in Colorado. And Barrel Bourbon is out with batch number 12 of its bourbon. This one is a nine-year-old high rye content bourbon. It'll be available nationwide in the U.S. We don't talk about fake whiskeys as much as perhaps we should, given that the demand for collectible whiskeys is going off the charts these days. It's hard to tell fakes from the real thing unless you have access to a gas chromatograph or other expensive testing gear, but Science Magazine reports a team of scientists at Germany's Heidelberg University have come up with a cheaper solution. They've created a series of fluorescent dyes that give off different colors depending on the whiskey's molecular makeup. Now, the dyes can't be used on their own to tell what a whiskey is, but they can be used against a known sample to identify fakes. 
You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney's single malt with Viking Soul, and a brand new website. Check it out at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stout Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo Edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Redbreast Lustau is now the latest award-winning member of the Redbreast family. It is Whiskey Advocates 2016 Irish Whiskey of the Year. Try a bottle for yourself. Last week I mentioned that I'll be heading down to Houston next month for the first time since we left Texas to move all the way north to Alaska back in 1991. I'll be leading a whiskey tasting at Reserve 101 in Houston on July 25th. Tickets are now on sale. They're $20 each, and 100% of the proceeds will be going to the Rescued Pets Movement, which helps rescue and relocate pets to new homes around the U.S. I've posted a link to their website in the show notes at whiskeycast.com, and if you're in the Houston area, I hope to see you there. Now I'm preparing for that by heading down to Texas for a couple of days this week. I'll be in Waco to visit the folks at Balconis Distilling, We'll have more on that next time around. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice. Last time around, I had some of your comments on our debate question on whether the atmosphere around the Isla Festival of Malt and Music has become maybe too obsessed with collecting and selling festival bottlings. Had a great response from Joe Lawson in Gloucestershire, England this week. I did Fagiel 2015, Spirit of Speyside Festival 2016, Campbellton Maltz Festival 2017. Bought my first ever festival bottling, then got my housemates to sign it. Festivals are as much about the people as the whiskey for me. Thanks, Joe, and she posted a photo of her Kilcarran Festival bottle. That's a keepsake that will have more sentimental value than commercial value. I love it when you share photos of your whiskeys with us. Kelly Walsh in Renton, Washington, went a step further, though, He posted a photo of his very elaborate new home bar on our Facebook page, along with this note. Thanks for all the knowledge. I found the best way to safely drink whiskey was to build the bar in my house. Should you find yourself in the Seattle area, I'll save you a seat. Kelly, that is one hell of a bar. And I did notice the bottle of Redbreast 12-year-old front and center. Nice. Next time I'm in Seattle, I'll let you know. I also wanted to thank Audible Feast on Twitter. She reviews all different types of podcasts and did a review on WhiskeyCast this week. One of her categories is, this podcast makes me a better person. We only got three out of five stars on that one, but it was the weakest point of our review. Overall, we got four out of five stars. Thanks. Grant Cummings at GC Pepper Guy on Twitter had this comment on last week's musical interlude with Elton John and Jack White. Loved that clip of Elton Official, Elton John's Twitter handle, that you included in this week's episode. How can one get a copy? I can't find it anywhere. There's a link to the YouTube video for that song, Two Fingers of Whiskey, in our show notes from last week's episode on the WhiskeyCast website. I pointed it out, and Grant tweeted back, Ha! I always forget about the website. Thanks, Mark. I'll check it out. Don't forget, we always include links for all of the whiskeys and stories we mention each week in the show notes at our website. And there's all sorts of other stuff that you can find at whiskeycast.com, too. Like the Your Voice page, where you can share your comments with whiskey lovers all over the world. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. My email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion, why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. 
He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run, just like a perfectly executed double play. Johnny Walker Blue Label is smooth and well-rounded, and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Wyoming Whiskey. This Thursday night will be a busy one with the Whiskey Jubilee in New York City, a whiskey dinner at Hayes Mansion in San Jose, California, and a fork and bottle dinner with Wild Turkey's Jimmy Russell at Lockbox in Lexington, Kentucky. The Edinburgh Whiskey Festival is this coming Saturday in Scotland, along with Pappy for Your Pappy Day at Buffalo Trace Distillery in Frankfort, Kentucky, and Whiskey Live Melbourne in Australia. Our friends at Reserve 101 in Houston have a Father's Day Highland Park tasting on Sunday the 18th, and Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore, Maryland kicks off its Whiskey on the Waterfront music series June 24th. The Aaron Malton Music Festival is June 30th through July 2nd in La Cranza, Scotland, and Journeyman Distillery in Three Oaks, Michigan hosts the Corsets, Whips, and Whiskey Festival on July 1st. Before you get any ideas, the building housing journeyman was once home to a corset factory and later a buggy whip maker. Those are just a few of the 142 different events on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival or a tasting coming up, use the contact form on our website and let us know all about it. We'd love to add it to the list. The calendar of events is brought to you by Wyoming Whiskey. There's a whiskey. It hails from the west. Kirby, Wyoming in the Bighorn Basin to be precise. Crafted from only Wyoming natural ingredients. And water from a limestone aquifer that lies a mile below the ground. It then spends five years in the barrel in the most unique maturation environment in the world. All under the careful eye of our distiller Sam Mead. The result? A singular bourbon that will disappear and live forever. Wyoming Whiskey. The Whiskey of the West. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Tom Bullitt was a successful lawyer in Kentucky when he decided to go out on a limb back in 1987 and get into the bourbon business. He took his great great grandfather's old whiskey recipe, went to Four Roses, and persuaded them to start making whiskey for him. If you remember recent bourbon history, not many people were buying bourbon back in 1987. And that old frontier recipe of Augustus Bollet's was two-thirds rye, one-third corn. Today we'd call that a rye whiskey, but Tom Bullitt and the folks at Four Roses worked up a bourbon mash bill, and Bullitt Bourbon was born. At that time, Four Roses was owned by Seagram's, and it bought the brand from Tom Bullitt in 1997. Five years later, Bullitt went to Diageo in the Great Seagram's Breakup. Back on March 14th of this year, Diageo opened its first new North American distillery in years in Shelbyville, Kentucky, and named it the Bullet Distilling Company. The other night, Bullet Barrel Strength made its debut in New York City as part of a nationwide rollout, following last year's first batch that was available only in Kentucky. That night, I sat down to chat with Tom Bullet. 30th anniversary this year. Did you think that this would be the 30-year overnight success that it's turned out to be? Well, I think I think we you, you hope for things, obviously. When you start companies and, and you have, have what, what is now called a vision or, or a hope or a dream, you hope it will come out. And then sometimes it does. I think what, what has been so interesting is that things have worked out, thanks to all sorts of people, obviously. But I think what is so interesting to me and, and we sort of, we've gone through a, a number of benchmarks that are very significant, as you know. We, we got together with Seagram's in 1997 as a partner, and then Diageo since 2002, which both have been incredible partnerships. So you would think you'd hit these benchmarks and you would say, boy, this is, this is so cool. But 
think, uh, I guess if you have a successful business, you're an entrepreneur, and if you're not, I'm not sure what you are. But but it, it, uh, it if you, you get to these sort of plateaus, and you would think, I remember when we got together with Seagram's, you would think I would have come out of the Seagram's building and done the touchdown sign, and there you go. But all you are is disoriented. I mean, it's just, it's really sort of a chase sport where, where versus uh, versus a finish sport. It's uh, So there's really, there's different plateaus. This year was obviously a huge one. It's a 30th wedding anniversary. It was my 74th birthday on March 14th and 30 years since we started the company and we opened our new distillery that day. So it was a big day in my life, needless to say. So that day when you walked out of the Seagram's building, was that sort of like the dog catching the car finally, going, what do I do with this now? Well, I think it, it kind of was. You, you just think, well, here, here is this. You're, you're, get, you're getting together with a wonderful big partner that can really make this big business work and achieve some scale. And, and I guess some people at that point just play golf. But I don't, I'm not a golfer and don't have the attention span to play ping pong, much less golf. So, so I think it's, you, you, it takes you a while to think, well, it's just surreal. Now, what's next? And it doesn't take long to figure out, well, you just get back on the horse and keep going. The same thing with, with the new distillery was a huge benchmark, but now I've got a wonderful focus on uh, certainly the domestic market, which is doing very well, and our international markets, which we're growing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be in Europe the last two weeks of June, and I'm really excited about that. Tell me about that first pitch meeting with the Bronfmans when you were pitching it to Seagram's. Now you remember these old stories, don't you? Because I've told you these stories before, which are really so much fun. I've gotten Bob Makel and Jack Mariucci. Well, it kind of the pre precursor to that was Arthur Shapiro, as we were getting together with Seagram's, who was a senior vice president, had an office, must have been 20 by 40, and huge offices like people used to have. Now everybody's in cubicles, but. At one point, uh, Arthur looked at me and he said, Now, Tom, what is the concept? And after some hesitation, I looked back and I said, Now, Arthur, what is a concept? And he said, Well, Tom, it's the proposition. It's the positioning of the brand. And I said, I'm going to have to get back to you on that, Arthur. So I had some wonderful friends who put me together with Bob Makel and Jack Mariucci and came up with, really based upon the history of the brand, this frontier whiskey sort of proposition, which is really to call the her heritage of the brand. Um, uh, when Augustus, my great-great-grandfather's, whose recipe bullet is, was distilling between 1830 and 1860, Kentucky would have been very close to the frontier, so it kind of pulls in that. And then, of course, the design of the bottle is recalls that industry, the, that, that time in our history, rather, the, the, uh, the, the old-fashioned medicine bottle. There had to have been some growing pains along the way, though. It hasn't always been smooth, has it? Oh, gosh, no. There are huge growing pains on and off, with, with, and, and still with some regularity. It, it, uh, my wife is a financial person, as you know, a stockbroker, Betsy, and I recall for years and years and years, about every three months, Betsy would say, now let's sit down and if you could explain to me, explain to me again how this is going to work, Tom, that would be great. So I... Made the, made the hard pitch. I remember my banker um, telling me, Tom, don't quit your day job before your night when comes on. It's just a, a lot of the challenges. I remember sending countless faxes to, into the international market to see if I could get an internet, a distributor in international. And of course, those were people who were interested, but I don't think understood the, the very serious proposition of ha gaining the appropriate licensure and permits to import bourbon and import beverage alcohol into different countries. Now, in 2002, you became part of Diageo, and at a time when, let's be charitable, the company wasn't that interested in bourbons for a long time. It, uh, it had you guys not much else in the way of bourbon, and you were sort of the exclusive bourbon within Diageo, but how hard was it to actually make that sell to get more attention within the company? 
Well, I think I think uh, Diageo, as we know, historically was a Scotch company, and they still are maybe the biggest Scotch company by a lot. I think, and and I think that that transition into bourbon certainly became very slow. We were very small at the time. Chris Musumichi was was our brand manager at the point that point, and what we concentrated on at the front end was distribution, pushing out to all 50 states which he did. He was a tiger and, and got us in all sorts of markets and then started to build a, build the scale of the brand. And and while it has while it has been certainly over 30 years given today's standards a very slow build, it's been a grassroots build. We we have great followers in the bartending community, our partners in chemistry. So it's it's got a it's got a real solid foundation. And, and that takes a lot of patience and a lot of money through the years. The brand was built really through ambassadorship and relationships and has a good foundation. And let's talk about one of those relationships. I remember being at Stitzel Weller a couple of years ago when you and Larry Schwartz opened up the Bullet Frontier Whiskey Experience. Larry spoke of this meeting that the two of you had in New York in what can best be described as a come to Jesus meeting where you sort of laid into him a little bit about the way uh, Bullet was not being handled properly within the company. I remember we had lunch together when we were in New York and you were telling me how unhappy you were, uh, which he can do. As charming as he can be, Mayor, he could, you know, and I'm, I know he's a respected citizen here, but uh, I respected him after that lunch and uh, and I remember it as clear as day, and we decided that we were going to embark on unleashing the potential of Tom Bullet. And from that day of about 43,000 cases, uh, we sold over 600,000 cases uh, this year, which is absolutely amazing. Um, I bring that up because after that, a lot of good things started happening, didn't it? Well, that is a story that I would never tell. I am one of Larry Schwartz's children, to say the very least. He ran Seagram's when we were with Seagram's, and then ran Diageo when we were with Diageo. <coughs> and I, I don't, that, that's a kind of an interesting remembrance, but I credit Larry, actually Larry Schwartz called Phil Gervasi, who was running California at the time, and John Tepper, who is his financial right hand. John runs the Southern Wine and Spirits Division now for Diageo and said, you know, I would really like to grow this brand and Don Julio. And that's exactly what those two fellas did. That is still both Don Julio and Bullet's best market is Northern California. So so I, I, will, I will always fall under, under w within the realm of, of uh, Larry's children. He, he also was, was set out the mantra absolutely for this brand. Is Tom, we are in the relationship business first and foremost, and he preached that for years, and I listened for years, and that's literally how we built our brand. And, and I, will, I will come back to that story. Larry Schwartz would not be convinced of anything that he didn't want to be, period. <laughs> and I know you wouldn't tell that story, but he's the one who told that story in front of a couple of hundred people at that ceremony, which is why I bring it up. But it was after that that we saw the 10 year old version, Bullet Rye, after that meeting and after Diageo decided to put some muscle behind Bullet, that we saw the 10 year, we saw the Bullet Rye, and now the barrel strength roll out. And that's when the good things really started happening is that uh, you got to actually build a line of whiskeys instead of just that one bourbon. Right. We, 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 have, a, we have a nice a small niche portfolio at this point, which I'm delighted with and don't want to much expand. Ultimately, we, we may do that, but we'll, we'll stick in our niche of straight-aged whiskeys. I think that was also probably the, the, the time where, 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 people, where, where bourbon was beginning to come on, one. The, the, the uh, social media was beginning to come on. The cocktail culture was beginning to come on, so it was kind of a perfect storm for a lot of us. And and it, that was not much after that. Diageo made a huge dis de decision to go ahead and build a distillery in Shelbyville, Kentucky, which, as you know, is an enormous and expensive proposition. If I remember right, the number was at least the number they told us was 115 million, probably a little bit more than that. What did you think when they said we're going to put Tom Bullet's name on the place? 
Well, I, th I thought uh, I thought that's a good idea. Actually, th there's a great there's a great uh, Edgar Allan Poe quote, and I don't know that I can do it off of my head, but we can figure out in due course. And it is something to the effect that that a name is an is a a uh, we're getting a little background here. Something that a recognized name is is um, maybe a throne or maybe maybe a castle in 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 uh, in occupancy. There's and I can't quote it, but it's a great name. And it and it, I think it was a sort of uh, completely what we're going to make there is Bullet Bourbon. So I think to name it the Bullet Distilling Company was was the right decision, and I'm glad everybody else did. What did you think when you saw the still running for the first time, making whiskey that was going to have your name on it, in a distillery that had your name on it? Well, that's that's another one of these sort of life dreams, and it's another benchmark. And and I will say, whenever you hit these really significant benchmarks, it's really just kind of disorienting. It's something you know, like like well, I've always wanted to look at sit in my office and look out the window, as I was saying earlier, and say, we grow. Where do you grow the grain? And well look out the, right there and where did the water come from well, look out right there and where do you distill well you just came through a door if you'd gone through the door on the other side right there so I, I think to have that proposition of really which we will ultimately of grain to glass is an in, incredible uh, proposition that I'm extraordinarily proud of and you have to have partners that, that are so serious about what we're doing it's unbelievable to get to that point well, and, and, and I think what you think of anything is the very small role that I really play in all of this. Have you moved your office from uh, Pappy's old office at Stitzel Weller out to the new place? No, I haven't. U ultimately, I will, but I haven't yet. We'll be there for probably at least a year, another year. You talk a lot about benchmarks. There aren't many more benchmarks left for you in this one, are there? In terms of uh, now that you've got the distillery... Once you get up to another couple million cases a year sold, what more benchmarks do you have left to accomplish before you uh, you hang it up? Well, I'm, people will ask, say, what's your exit, Tom? And I always say, well, death. You know, I'm, I'm not going to hang it up. I don't know how to do anything else. And I love this. But there are really a lot of other benchmarks. There, There's all sorts of things. For instance, one of the benchmarks that I mentioned earlier that I'm concentrating very closely on is our international distribution and sales. And we're growing nicely in Western Europe. But there's all sorts of out. When I, when I wrote the business plan in 1987, I, I have always thought, and I still do, that, that the international market will ultimately be larger than the domestic market, if by scale, if nothing else, and certainly by the fact that, that the, the United States has such an influence in, in culture and entertainment in the world, much like the British did in a prior century. So I, I think bourbon is going to be popular, and that's, that's sort of the next thing we're looking very closely at. Has Betsy stopped asking you when this thing is going to make money yet? Well, well, Betsy's a little easier on me now, but Betsy, of course, is, has, has like a real job. This is her 40th year as a stockbroker with Hilliard Lines. I've had an amazing business partner for years and years and a person who, who helped educate the children when I was, when I, when I was hopeful. And, and paid the rent when I was hopeful. So she's, she's, uh, she's in a happier, I get fewer questions now. I've, although I still am, have not got her entirely convinced, I'll come in, I travel all the time, and when I get home I'll say, let's see Big Tom's in the house, and she'll say, Big Tom, take the garbage out. So I, she, she's been a firm supporter, but, but uh, keeps me uh, thinking like I should. The Bullet Frontier Whiskey Experience is located at the Stitzel Weller Distillery Campus in Louisville, but Tom Bullet did drop a hint the other night that there might eventually be a visitor's center at the Bullet Distillery in Shelbyville. Diageo's official position since that project was first announced has been that there won't be any visitor facilities at that distillery, so this might just represent a change in that position. We'll keep you posted. That's this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, where patience has been awarded. Lagavulin 25 is Whiskey Advocates' Isla Single Malt of the Year. 
This 25-year-old whiskey, matured exclusively in sherry casks, is a recognition of the distillers that have crafted Lagavulin across the years. Learn more at malts.com. Let's start off the What I'm Tasting This Week department with the 2017 version of Bullet Barrel Strength. This year's edition is bottled at 59.6% ABV, just slightly less than last year's Kentucky-only version. The nose has a good balance of soft spices, honey, molasses, brown sugar, pipe tobacco, leather, and oak. The taste is spicy and intense with cinnamon, black pepper, and chili powder notes that gradually fade to reveal honey, brown sugar, and oak touches that linger with the spices through the finish. This one definitely benefits from a bit of water. It opens up dark chocolate and caramel notes, tames the spices, and stretches out the finish. I'm scoring the 2017 edition of Bullet Barrel Strength an 89. Now, if that one is an iron fist, whiskey-wise, Compass Box's Double Single is more like a silk glove. This third edition of Double Single matches up single malt from Glen Elgin in Speyside with single-grain whiskey from Girvin. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and the nose is fruity and fresh with vanilla cream, banana, and a bit of caramelized ginger. The taste is fruity and vibrant with banana, a hint of mango, vanilla cream, apple, and dried flowers. And the finish has subtle spices that appear with hints of ginger and allspice, complemented nicely by vanilla and red apples. I'm scoring the Compass Box double single a 90. Finally, let's look at the debut release of Slain Irish Whiskey from Brown Foreman which will open its new distillery at Slane Castle near Dublin later this summer. This is sourced Irish whiskey that's been matured and finished in a combination of virgin oak, ex-bourbon and Tennessee whiskey barrels, and ex-Oloroso sherry casks. It's bottled at 40% ABV. The nose, fruity and floral with straw, ginger root, dried flowers, honey, vanilla, and a slightly herbal touch. The taste is well balanced between fruity and spicy notes with green apples, allspice, candied pear slices, ginger root, orange peel, and honey. The finish is medium length with lingering fruits and honey, and I'm scoring the debut release of Slain Irish Whiskey an 87. I've added these tasting notes to our searchable list of almost 1,900 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. To be precise, 1896. That's also where you'll find links for Whiskey Cast HD and Whiskey Cast virtual tastings episodes, the latest whiskey news, events, and much more, including a complete archive of past episodes. Let's keep the cask strength conversation going all week long. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast, and my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com Whiskeycast brought to you by Redbreast the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey those in the know know Redbreast you don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2017, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.